Greetings, everybody. Peter Maravellis here on behalf of City Lights Booksellers and Publishers and the City Lights Foundation. I'd like to welcome you to City Lights Live, the reading series that follows in the footsteps of our in-store calendar. As always, we are beaming to you from the unceded ancestral grounds of the Ramatishaloni peoples, also known as the San Francisco Bay Area, from where we continue to feature the works of authors we know and love through readings, discussions, and forums moving into the spring season. We would like to take this moment to make a land acknowledgement and pay respects to those who have come before us as stewards of the land. Tonight, we are celebrating the publication of The Beats in Mexico, a new book by David Cologne, published by Rutgers University Press. This is the first book length study of why the beats were so fascinated by Mexico and how they represented its culture in their work. This volume examines such canonical figures as Kerouac, Burroughs, Ginsburg, Lamantia, McClure, and many more. It also devotes individual chapters to women, such as Margaret Randall, Bonnie Bremser, and Joanne Kiger, who each made Mexico a central setting of their work and interrogated the misogyny they encountered in both American and Mexican culture. David Stephen Cologne is the author of numerous books. These include The Spiritual Imagination of the Beats and Diane de Prima, Visionary Poetics in the Hidden Religions. He has also edited five volumes of prose by Charles Bukowski that City Lights has published, as well as interviews with Gary Snyder and Allen Ginsberg. Mr. Cologne lives in, the, in Ann Arbor, Michigan and has taught at the University of Texas at Austin, the University of Michigan and the University of Chicago. He currently teaches at Eastern Michigan University in Ypsilanti. So joining him tonight, we have a special guest we're honored to have with us for the occasion, Margaret Randall, who played a prominent role in the Mexico scene. She was in Mexico at the time that the Beats lived and worked there and has had firsthand knowledge of the key figures, the time and the place. Margaret Randall is a feminist poet, a writer, a translator, a photographer, and social activist. She is the author of over 150 books. She is the recipient of numerous awards for her work. Out of Violence into Poetry is her most recent collection. She also has new work coming out this summer. City Lights will be featuring her in a reading of her own. And, you know, we also have one more special guest, I am happy to say. Homero Origis is with us tonight. Very, very honored. He is a Mexican poet, a novelist, environmental activist, a journalist, and diplomat, known for his rich imagination, poetry of just lyrical beauty and ethical independence. So very, very honored to have him as well. So join us now in giving a warm welcome to David Cologne, Margaret Randall, and Homero Origes. Everyone, welcome to City Lights. Well, thank you, Peter. Uh, I'll just say a few words about how it came about to write this book. Uh, I was born in Los Angeles. My father was born in Martinique and my mother is Armenian. So uh, I think I grew up with a kind of sensitivity to those who were not uh, real Americans as they used to say. In fact, I remember back in the 50s, they used to talk about foreigners. I don't think they use that word anymore, but I think in a sense uh, that may possibly have predisposed me towards uh, my sense of affinity with the uh, the Mexicans of California. I, I also, I, I remember vaguely, I believe Spanish was a required course in seventh grade. I think uh, I remember Mrs. Reed took us to a trip from Thousand Oaks down to uh, Tijuana when I was in seventh grade. So uh, all those aspects, I think, predisposed me. Of course, then in college, I, I started reading the beats and I've written, my first book is about William Soroyan, who was a, a great Armenian American writer. Uh, in fact, uh, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, I, I suppose I want to pay tribute to him. He passed away last year. Uh, Ferlinghetti was kind enough to write a brief preface to a, a short essay I wrote about Sarayan and the influence of Sarayan on, on Jack Kerouac. So, uh, so the whole idea of uh, my ethnicity, I suppose, and then reading uh, Kerouac and reading Ginsburg and Burroughs and then uh, the female writers more recently, Margaret Randall and Joanne Kiger and Bonnie Bremser. I've taught courses in beat literature. So it all sort of started to come together in my mind the last four or five years. Uh, I think also I made several trips over the last two and a half decades to Mexico. 
and got to see a lot of these places that Beats wrote about. So uh, I've been to all the sites in the Maya land and uh, the great uh, monuments and ruins. And this all became quite fascinating for me because I could uh, read Margaret Randall and then see the places uh, she wrote about. So that was another spark, I suppose. Maybe a couple of figures behind all this, of course, are D.H. Lawrence, who I loved as a teenager. I still love him very much. I think in a way I was also retracing, or trying to retrace the link between people like Lawrence, uh, this sort of uh, search for a spiritual uh, primal experience that he looked for in Mexico. And uh, I read The Plume Serpent, of course, and then reread it. And I think that that was part of my goal in the book, too, to sort of try to connect the beats to the tradition of Lawrence. And I also bring up Artaud and some of the French writers, Bataille uh, and uh, Leclercio, who also make Mexico such a primal part of their itinerary, their, their spiritual itinerary. And I think maybe I, I seem to be saying that word I, spiritual uh, uh, quite a bit. I the last three or four books I've written sort of are kind of continuous search for uh, the kinds of spiritual underpinnings of the beat writers. Uh, the spiritual uh, imagination of the beats I published in 2017 with uh, Cambridge Press, and I tried to look at La Mantilla and Ginsburg and Kerouac all in terms of their interest in Buddhism and also in esoteric philosophy. Uh, and then Diane de Prima I wrote about next. And of course she was deeply involved in the spiritual quest. And then when I started to see, you know, La Mantilla and Kerouac and Ginsburg and, and Bonnie Bremster and Margaret Randall and uh, Michael McClure and Jim Morrison, <laughs> all going to Mexico in, in search of this spiritual kind of truth. I think that also is a catalyst for the book. So all those themes sort of came together uh, and that's what I've done. I, I, I think I've, I hope I've achieved what I what I set out to do. It was a bit difficult. I suppose the book could have been twice as long if I had, if, if I had uh, been allowed to write twice as much. But I tried to, um, in a sense, uh, connect the themes from writer to writer and to deal with them as extensively as I could in, in the space provided. But uh, that was my goal, basically to trace the cultural, spiritual, uh, and the uh, European antecedents to the beads. Also, I've got a section in the beginning about San Francisco, obviously, and the, the beginnings of the, the discovery of Artaud by the beads, Michael McClure and uh, La Mantilla reading, uh, and Robert Duncan also, uh, and then Charles Olson with the beat, uh, with the uh, Black Mountain people. So uh, there's a kind of confluence that I try to trace also between the, the uh, San Francisco beats, the Black Mountain, Charles Olson people, then Robert Duncan with the San Francisco Renaissance because he was also reading Artaud and was interested in shamanism and that sort of thing. So I think that's kind of a quick, I don't know if I took five minutes already, but five minute uh, summary of what I was trying to do in the book. So let's hear now from Margaret Randall. Okay, thank you, Peter. And uh, thank you, David, for that uh, summary. It's always interesting to uh, hear a little bit about the process, how something is born, a book like this. It's great to see you, Omero, um, from, uh, yes. we haven't seen each other since those heady days in the 1960s in Mexico City, exactly. which, which is really what this book is about. So. Um, I've written uh, a couple of pages that I'm going to read um, just sort of at 85, it's easier for me to get it written down and, and not forget anything. So I asked myself this question, what differentiates the beats in Mexico from so many other books um, about the beats or about Mexico in the 1960s? And of course, a lot differentiates it. Most books about the 60s are revisionist at best, in my opinion, often intentionally misleading. They either romanticize or trivialize the dec decade 
really representing it as being as powerful as it was, either culturally or politically. Most US American authors writing about Mexico other the country and its people, then denigrating or exoticizing them. And I think Kalan goes to the work itself, communes with it deeply and gives us observations that convince. And this is the other immense contribution Kalan me makes, rather than speaking only of the poet's travels and web of connections, he goes to the texts themselves looking for clues to bi-directional influence. By the beginning of the decade here in the United States, McCarthyism was finished, but the witch hunt still cast an intimidating shadow, especially for writers and artists. In the larger world, the stifling 50s had commodified the effects of the war in Europe and Japan, and we thought fascism was defeated, but we didn't yet understand how various nationalisms would develop on both sides of the, of the so-called Iron Curtain already spawning Holocausts to come. Women suffered all these influences in dismissive and exploitative ways. And another decade would pass before feminism's second wave began defining the patriarchal damage we carried. The beat movement was a natural response to these forces. Poets and other creative minds are often the vanguard of cultural change. And this was what happened when the beats came on the scene, projecting a new ethos and energy for US poetry, just as earlier generations of writers and artists had gone to Europe for inspiration. Many beat poets traveled south to Mexico, looking to absorb something of that country's ancient cultures, as well as the imagination of its contemporary artists and writers. Where the women were concerned, Kalan's book situates us in our rightful place alongside the men. An interesting example for me is Bonnie Bremser, married to the poet Ray Bremser, who jumped bail in New York State and took his family to Mexico in 1961. Bonnie has long been a footnote to that story but here in this book, her own creative writing is analyzed. I went, to live in, I went to live in Mexico City in the fall of 1961, and I'd remained there for the next eight years, immersing myself in a nation known for welcoming travelers from across the globe, especially refugees escaping repressive situations in their countries of origin. Benito Juarez's dictate El respeto al derecho ajeno es la paz, which means respect for the beliefs of others is peace, has long guided Mexico's immigration policy. I soon met writers and artists from all over the Americas and the world, some of whom, like Henry Miller, Ernesto Cardinal, David, David uh, Alfaro Siqueiros, Loret Sejournet, Leonora Carrington, Leon Felipe, Mario Benedetti, Bea Akmadulina, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, Allen Ginsberg, Rafael Alberto, Alberti, Julio Cortázar, Rocky Dalton, René de Pestre, et cetera, et cetera, would prove to be the luminaries of the next generation. With Mexican poet Sergio Mondragón, I founded and for eight years edited El Cordon Plumado, The Plume Torn. This was a bilingual literary journal that crossed borders, bringing the best new work from south to north and north to south. And the idea for the magazine was hatched at the nightly salon hosted in Mexico City's Colonia Cuauhtémoc by Philip Lamantilla and the woman who was then his wife, Lucille Desjardins, where poets from several latitudes met and read to one another. We wanted to offer good translation and did, although never as much as we hoped. Still, over a period of eight years, the magazine published more than 700 writers and artists from 35 countries and put us in touch with cutting edge movements throughout the world. Surrealists, guerrilla poets, 
deep imagists, concrete poets, exteriorists, beats, and many others graced our pages, our refusal to become a mouthpiece for a single literary so school was important to our success. David Kalan's book casts a net that is both deep and wide. His research is exciting and meticulous. His institutions creative, his intuitions, excuse me, creative and co courageous. His genius is in the connections he traces among the beat poets ourselves, between us and our Mexican colleagues and how a land where ancient cultures still live and breathe influenced us all. He analyzes important texts, pointing out styles and meanings rarely explored in such context or depth. He creates maps, overlapping maps. I am particularly grateful to Kalan. As I say, I lived in Mexico for eight years, married a Mexican, gave birth to three children there, was intimately involved in a variety of cultural scenes and published my first books with Siglo Ventiuno Editores, a publishing house which creatives of all stripes helped to establish. I even adopt, adapted Mexican citizenship. In 1968, I took an active role in the vast student movement that engulfed almost the entire nation and suffered a repression that forced me out of the country a year later. And it was El Cordon Plumado. The magazine has received a great deal of attention in recent years, yet in most previous texts highlight, highlighting US poets in Mexico, I have only been mentioned briefly. As a woman, I was a footnote to official history. The Beats in Mexico contains chapters about Lawrence Ferlinghetti, William Burroughs, Philip Lamantia, Jack Kerouac, Allen Ginsberg, Bonnie Bremser, Michael McClure, and Jim Morrison, Joanne Kiger, and myself. It also mentions other major writers with sig significant links to the country, such as Charles Olson and Diane de Prima. Sadly, all but two of us are no longer living. So much valuable history has been lost or ignored. And Kalan does us a great service by creating a map on which we can find one another and pieces of our pasts. The book is important for anyone interested in exploring the beat imagination, the influence Mexico, both ancient and modern, has had on several generations of US poets and the diverse ways in which Mexico's many imaginaries have impacted our own cultural unfolding. It puts women back in the story on both sides of the border. And it is also a fascinating read, a many threaded story you won't be able to put down. So that's what I, I uh, got down on paper and I think we'll get it into a more interesting uh, informal conversation as we go along. So thanks very much. Thank you, Margaret. Um, next up is Homero Aregis. Um, Homero, um, I need you to activate your video, please. There should be a little prompt there. Homero, can you hear us? I think maybe they're having some trouble with, with their, with their Wi-Fi. Homero, can you hear us? You need to activate your video. Okay, well, um, I guess they're gonna sort through that. Uh, meanwhile, um, let's just, uh, you know, go into conversation. Um, David, Margaret, why don't you start it out? And then uh, when Homero kind of pops back in, we can, you know, bring him into the discussion. Well, thank you, Margaret. That was very kind of you. Uh, you know, I uh, actually, if home at all, I actually did include a picture of Homero. You probably can't see this, but this is a picture of Homero with Florence Ferlinghetti that Betty Ferber, uh, Homero's wife, kindly provided for, to me. And, uh, you know, I was actually trying to think if I should read something from this because uh, 
don't know if I can just... Yeah, we're looking for the way to... Oh, he's back. Good. Yeah, no, I am here. The, the problem is to... That they, uh, you can't them. start your video because the host has stopped it, it says. Oh, there we go. I, okay. I am here now. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, came back the image. Well, what do you want now to, 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 to I, I speak about the, uh, the, um, the meeting in, in 50, in Mexico City, I met uh, Philip Lamantia in Mexico City in 1959. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, when I go on telling the story. I, I met Philip Lamanti in Mexico City in 1959. I was 19 years old and had a fellowship of the Mexican Writers Center to write poetry. He and other American beatniks who were visiting Mexico used to meet at the Café de las Americas on Avenida Juarez, which was owned by Moshe Rosenberg. He was living with Lucille de Jardin, a French woman who worked at the Pal Palace of Fine Arts designing costumes. One plate she did costumes for was the Mandrake by Machiavelli. She also had a small parts in place. At parties, she, she used to wear a blue night suit and a collar of fake pearls. They live in number five, North Oslo Street, and they later became La Zona Rosa, the pink zone. I remember Philip standing on the balcony overlooking Nisa Street, one day telling me about San Francisco and the beats. I showed him some poems that would be in my first book, Los Ojos Desdoblados, and he gave me a copy of his book, Ecstasy. This was his life. I think Homero may have froze up. Homero, can you hear us? Yeah, it looks, looks like your Wi-Fi has frozen up. Oh gosh, okay. Well, <laughs> let's continue. Um, David, uh, David, Margaret, I guess, yeah, he's, he's gone. Um, oh, well. That's a shame, that's a shame. Yeah, because, I, uh, he was evoking such a vivid picture of yeah. uh, what things were like. I didn't even remember the name of the street where uh, La Mantilla lived, and I just learned from what uh, Omeda was saying that it was Oslo Street. Um, yeah. But uh, hopefully he'll be back later. So, uh, David, why don't uh, yeah, I, we get I, it? Maybe I, 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 there's this wonderful poem of La Mantilla uh, he wrote when he was in Mexico City when he was discovering Pseudo Dionysius, the area of Areopagite this mystical poem and this uh this is a section from it he says uh there is this look of love there is the tower of david there is the throne of wisdom there is this silent look of love constant flight and air of the holy ghost i long for the luminous darkness of god i long for the super essential light of this darkness another darkness i long for the end of longing i long for the it is nameless what i long for a spoken word caught in its own meat saying nothing. This nothing ravishes beyond ravishing. There is this look of love, thrown, silent look of love. So <laughs> that was one of his Mexico poems. <laughs> I noticed that um, there are a couple of uh, questions from people in the audience. Uh, somebody named Michael Green 
uh, asked the question, were the beets in Mexico exposed to the magic mushroom phenomenon, phenomenon as revealed by Gordon Wasson on, in Life magazine? And um, I think probably most of the beets did um, ingest the magic mus mushroom um, with Maria Savina. Um, I'm not sure it was um, as revealed by Gord by anybody in Life magazine, but uh, yeah, there's a great picture of her in the book. Uh, but I know that a lot of the uh, beets who came to Mexico uh, experimented with different kinds of drugs. Um, so I imagine, yes, the answer to that question is yes. Yeah, and Xochipilli, uh, uh, I have him as a frontispiece here. At least one theory is that along the side of his body on this great sculpture, there are actually these uh, psychotropic uh, botanical substances. And uh, I do try to cover that aspect from Bonnie Bramser to, and Michael McClure went there, they're looking for mushrooms, Bruce Connor, the artist, and uh, then they also fed into the Stanford and Berkeley and Harvard projects with uh, Leary using uh, these substances for exploring consciousness. And, and there, that's a way the beats were really doing some ahead of their time work with the possibility of these substances can be used for therapeutic purposes as well, which of course at the time everybody was simply uh, poo-pooing LSD, uh, but uh, not everybody, but they were in the tradition of Aldous Huxley. They had read uh, The Doors of Perception. And, and I have a section on, um, on Jim Morrison, I'm sure you all know that the Doors based their name of their rock group on Aldous Huxley's book about um, about mescaline. So I, I do try to deal with that theme as well. I think one of the great things about your book um, were the graphics that you used. I mean, the selection of graphics is just beautiful. Both people's uh, the some of the the statuary. Um, some of uh, the portraits of people, like the one this, of this is Getty. Margaret, this is one of mine, yeah. One of Margaret's great photographs. <laughs> so that was taken in Chiapas, of course, many years later. I didn't have a camera at the time that uh, I lived in Mexico. Uh, so, uh, but, you know, I have, I have uh, two daughters who live in Mexico. Um, with their families, one in Puebla and one in Mexico City. So I go there pretty often, uh, but I loved your selection of graphics. I thought that they were terrific. Oh, good. Yeah, in fact, there's one that I took uh, myself of San Miguel de Allende. I do try to trace out the importance of San... Oh, wait, here's another La Mantilla. This is actually from one of La Mantilla's uh, notebooks that he kept while he was in Mexico. It's at the Berkeley Library. And I included this because he's actually trying to learn the language of the Cora people, the indigenous Cora people. And he's got the Spanish on one side and then the Cora uh, on the other. And part of my uh, purpose too was, you guys probably know the, the critique of the beats. There's uh, two famous articles in the Partisan Review uh, uh, and uh, in Horizon, Ro uh, Roger, uh, Roger Brustein and uh, uh, Norman Podhoritz. Podhoritz has an essay called The, the Know Nothing Bohemians. And uh, Bruce Dean's article is The Cult of Unthink. So this is the popular imagination in the late, in the late 50s that the, that the beats were these uneducated primitives. And uh, so I really try to, to show how completely literary to the fingertips they were, not only literary, but you know they strove to understand the languages. They, they studied the, the history. They, they they took their guidebooks with them and learned about the, the history of the country. So I, I think this is still something I, I, I've been trying to, uh, you know, overthrow, which is this notion that the Beats were somehow uh, uneducated. I mean, my God, they all, many of them went to Ivy League universities and many of them were hyper intellectual. So I don't know how that got started. I think there was a conflation maybe in the 50s between the supposed Beatniks, quote unquote, whoever they were, and, and the Beats. Um, I mean, I would put them up against T.S. Eliot or any other intellectuals <laughs> of the American literary world, and they could hold their own quite easily. So, uh, and I yeah. think that's intentional. I mean, I think that 
when we talk about our most powerful moments in history, um, which are also often our most subversive moments, um, there's always um, uh, there's always someone or many people from mass media, from the corporate media, who want to pigeonhole those movements and those people in ways that are dismissive um, because they're afraid uh, that they may inspire people today. And I think the 60s especially was a, a period of not just intellectualism, but tremendous connections, um, political courage, um, all kinds of um, really interesting movements. Uh, and yet, of course, people are afraid of that. And so, you know, there's always someone willing to uh, to get their 30 um, pieces of silver <laughs> by uh, dismissing all of that. I see Jim, a Jim Morrison, oh, Jim Morrison touching the uh, great Quetzalcoatl and the Teotihuacan, and Jim Morrison, another supposed ignorant person, was reading Rambo and uh, writing letters to Wallace Fowley, who was the translator of Rambo, and uh, reading books on shamanism and, and Joseph Campbell and, and Jung and blah, blah, blah. So again, that's a, a yeah. <laughs> sorry, I'm jumping back to that topic because it, it's something I'm, I think I'm upset about still. <laughs> That there is this, as you say, Margaret, this, uh, and I think you're right. It's like, you know, let's, uh, it's like Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail. I often wonder, which is a tremendous document. I mean, King uh, quotes from uh, Eliot and St. Augustine and Tertullian, and, and, and he's sending this letter to these Southern, uh, you know, preachers who were, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not saying all Southern preachers are not intellectual, but I, I, I would, I would doubt that they got half of the references that Martin Luther King put in that letter from Birmingham jail, and he was supposedly the, yeah, the, the ignorant black man, right? So anyway, I see that in the in the chat, there's also a, a question from someone named Chelsea Riley, um, who asks. And I think this might be directed at me. Can you share some of the similarities and or differences concerning the treatment of women in the US and Mexico? And I assume that you mean um, at that time in the 60s. Um, I would say that, um, you know, the 60s were the second wave of feminism was not yet around. Uh, so women, most of us were not really uh, conscious or we didn't, we couldn't articulate what we were suffering in terms of sexism, misogyny, and so forth. I would say that um, in Mexico, the misogyny was kind of right out there. It was in your face, you know. It was sort of the macho Latino version of patriarchy. In the United States, it might have been a bit more subtle. Um, I kind of preferred the Mexican ver version, uh, or I, I. Um, found the Mexican version easier to deal with because it was so out there, because it was so obvious, um, you could respond to it. Uh, one could respond to it, or I felt that I could respond to it um, more uh, completely. But I think um, none of us women, and I, I speak for myself, but for many women of that era, really um, understood how that was undermining us. You know, we, I remember being, being hearing phrases like she writes like a man. And that was, you know, a, a compliment. It was supposed to be a compliment. Um, and we took those compliments if they were directed at us and we appreciated them without really understanding how underhanded they were. So um, at the end of the sixties, of course, um, the first texts began to come down from the feminist movement in the United States and in France. And um, for me, it was something that changed my life. I mean, I, when I began to understand feminism as a philosophy and as a way of understanding power, not just between men and women, but power in general, um, it changed my life. And uh, so I, I began to experience that in Mexico. and. Um, that was very important for me at the time. I don't know if that answers your question, Chelsea.
I see another question. Did the Beats have any contact with the artist Leonora Carrington? It's the question is from William Ames. Um, I had uh, a great deal of contact with her. She was a good friend. We published her in um, our magazine. And um, so uh, she was an amazing woman. She was an amazing artist, thinker, uh, philosopher. I remember the first uh, time I went to lunch at her house. I don't know, it might've been around 62 or 63. Um, she was rewriting um, the Bible according to uh, her ideas of what the Bible should have been. So she was inventive. She, was, uh, she had a terrific imagination. Um, I, I'm sure that Omero also had contact with her. It's really a shame that we can't hear from him right now, but um, I don't know if you have anything particular to say about her, David. Yeah, I was just looking, Philip Lamontia met her also. I don't know whether- uh, Romero is actually back in the room now. Let me oh, see if I can activate his video. Okay. Well, I was talking about Philip Lamantia. Uh, he was the person who translated my first poems into English, and also the poems about Cirabel. But Philip was deported from Mexico on June 30, 1959. Th that was a very traumatic moment because he went to jail and he was deported with another person arrested in Avenida Juarez, number eight, at, at 12.30 and June 29, 1959. The police saw two individuals who appeared to be foreigners who were standing and smoking. And as they passed nearby, they noticed the, the peculiar smell of marijuana. Then he was deported and we, we have to look for him in jail. The two individuals, when they were searched on account of his, of his this, uh, suspicious actions, they found a little red metal box on one who said his name was Philip Lamantia, a box usually containing Virginia cigarettes, the Graven brand. English, inside of which there was a piece of blue letter with the name of Manu Arado to the chief of the, and they were taken by, interrogated by the chief of the Federal Narcotics Bureau. We went to see him in jail uh, because they, it was the jail where they put uh, Che Guevara and Fidel Castro was the, the jail for, uh, for, uh, for foreigners, uh, for drugs and politic, politics, politic activity. Then Philip was deported and he, he was very frustrated because he left behind him a Lucille de Jardin. And uh, he began to, uh, Philippe began to write from the United States asking me about what happened to Lucille because she, uh, they were incommunicated. Uh, and that was the, the very dramatic moment with Philip. And he was afraid to come back to Mexico because he was in the list of uh, and, uh, indeseables uh, foreigners who were deported because uh, drugs or political activities. Then was always very traumatic moment for Philip because uh, not only in, uh, was the interruption of his life in Mexico City, but the interruption of his life with Lucille de Jardin. Then was uh, was this moment uh, later in the years, I, I was, I had in my hands the, the confidential um, um, re, re, in the Ministry of Immigration about Philip, where they counted uh, was the uh, relationship with about who, uh, who was Philip. 
Anay Rota, um, um, Peace Call, El Poeta Beatifico, with all the details of his deportation from Mexico to the United States. What you mentioned also about the, the people looking for the hallucination of mushrooms. That was the Mexican chaman from Oaxaca, Maria Sabina. She became a friend of us uh, later in life because one day she was in sick and my wife and me uh, looked, uh, looked for Mexican poets to bring her from Oaxaca, Guacta de Jimenez, to, to be in, uh, attended by, uh, by his illness. Maria Sabina became very good friend of us and he came in case that in case of nuclear weapon uh, war, we can stay with her in this cave in Oaxaca. She, she was visited many times by beatniks, beat, the beatniks and later by the hippies. The hippies were uh, more numerous, and the Mexican police began to, to, to be arresting people because they were after drugs with Maria Sabina. And Maria Sabina was an um, um, indigenous woman who didn't know exactly what was happening around her, why so many policemen and, and, and hippies were visiting Guacla de Jimenez. They wanted to, to experiment the uh, hongos hallucinantes. And she became a very good friend of us and visited us in my house and until the day of her death. I, I, I wrote even a book all uh, carne de Dios. Well, looks like Homero has frozen up again. Um, yeah, well, let's let's continue. <laughs> Homero, I'm so sorry. I don't know if you can hear us. Uh, you, you've completely frozen. Um, so David, why don't we continue? And then maybe um, maybe he can come back into the picture. Yeah, I have a a section discussed in Carne de Dios, it's the, the Aztec uh, Teo, Teo, Teo not tacto. can't remember the Aztec word, but uh, the flesh of the gods, yeah, that's the name for the magic mushrooms. And uh, Wasson, Robert Wasson is the guy who came and, and started writing about it. There's a big Life magazine article. And then Robert Graves, the British poet, famously, sampled them. He wrote an essay about the, the mushrooms of Dionysus or something like that. We started, you know, theorizing that the ancient Greeks had, had used these uh, mushrooms. But um, yeah, so uh, I think there was a question about the academic uh, in the chat about whether the beats are taught at universities. I've taught a course in the beats several times at my university. And I know it's it's they are included in the anthologies now. Uh, uh, yeah, I think because of the the ecological awareness they had and the the uh, the uh, the political the, the the gender issues that are now so prominent, uh, they are newly newly relevant. And uh, besides, I mean, this whole canon formation stuff has always puzzled me. I. I I really think it, it it must be that some sort of you know like how like uh, like the um, um, Harold Bloom at Yale you know suddenly he started talking about Wallace Stevens as being important you know and then suddenly people thought oh yes you know the the, the who were the great American poets they were supposed to be Robert Frost and and Eliot and uh, and and then suddenly oh well maybe Wallace Stevens uh, is really better than we think he is <laughs> and then same thing with uh, Faulkner right that the French uh, Sartre and Camus were writing about Faulkner in the 40s, and in, in America, Faulkner was completely unknown. And then suddenly, you know, Malcolm Cowley put out this uh, the portable Faulkner, and then, so, yeah, I, it's a puzzle, thing, puzzle to me. Maybe somebody can explain it to me. It seems to be some sort of intersection of, you know, academic uh, approval and uh, et cetera, but, uh, you know, uh, how these things, I think it's a bit like fashion, you know? <laughs> It looks like Homero is back, but I'm yeah, going no, yeah, to try to. Okay. 
But yeah, you, now we're, not, we're gonna leave the point. video off. And so you can just try it with the audio and then maybe that'll work better. You just, okay. just continue with the audio. Make sure you're home. Case. Wherever you well, well uh, do you want me to talk about Philippe Lamantian or what is one? Homero, why don't yes. you, uh, Homero, it would be yes. wonderful to hear you talk a little bit about what your impressions were of the beats while you were down there. Can you hear me, Omero? Yes. Why don't you read this poem? Yes, yes. Oh, well, I wanted great. to yeah. read the, the poem about a, a poet beatific about Philip Lamantia. Beautiful, thank you. Yes, my poem. I wanted to read it because it's, as I'll tell the he, uh, the, uh, he says, I think of you, land of the warrior, my house of water on the hill, my dreams in a naked crowd, Philip Lamantia ecstasies. He, he was he was very special, Philip, because he had the American tradition, all the, the movement of San Francisco, and also the, the people, the uh, rebel poets, and he was very well read in French poetry, but he was the first to come to Mexico City, to live in Mexico City. Later, uh, Margaret was coming also, but a few, a few years later. And there was very, a very good moment because there was a moment of the, the American poet was interested in Mexico, uh, coming even from the uh, Lawrence and people who were interested in Mexico and also Kerouac and uh, William S. Burroughs, who killed his wife in Mexico City, Juan Bolmer. And Leonora Carrington, Margaret was mentioning, uh, mentioned Leonora Carrington. As a matter of fact, Leonora Carrington told me the, the day when she met William S. Burroughs in Mexico City, in the colonia and in the street of Chihuahua because Leonora was living in this street and uh, Burroughs was uh, in that moment was, uh, Leonora was terrified by, by his presence because he had guns and <laughs> on both sides, two guns. And also he was famous because he called, he killed his wife, Johan Bolmer. And then when Leonora met him in the street of Chihuahua, they were living in the same neighborhood. And Leonora wanted to run away from Burroughs because the, the guns came to policemen and tell, told uh, William Burroughs that he couldn't be having uh, guns with him. And William Burroughs took the guns out, out and told the, the, the policeman, what do you want? And the policeman, when they saw him with two guns, they ran away. Then Leonora didn't know what to do because uh, uh, he, he, she knew uh, who William S. Burroughs was, but she had, he was uh, uh, known as very violent and also looking for young boys in the streets and for, uh, also looking for drugs. Then there was the moment of uh, Leonora Carrington and William S. Burroughs in, in the, the Calle de Chihuahua. But uh, it was a very interesting moment that is, go, is gone now. The, the, the communication, the connection between the American poetry and the Mexican and Latin American was in this moment uh, because the, the, the Americans wanted to go to Mexico because uh, Kerouac, Burroughs, Lawrence, many, many people were coming, but uh, that now doesn't exist anymore. It's strange, but the, the, the beatniks, uh, want, uh, you, you were walking the streets and you went to a market and you saw the beatnik poets eating in the market. Mexican tacos, and sometimes you saw women walking in the night, uh, a, a, a blonde, beautiful women, beatniks, walking in the night in Mexico City. 
but uh, it was very strange way because they found like freedom in Mexico. I don't know what kind of freedom was very intense. And when I met the, the Beats in Mexico, that was very interesting for my poetry also, because it was like the tradition of uh, the French, like meeting Rimbaud. Philip Lamanti was very fond of Arthur Rimbaud poetry. And that was this kind of Lotre Amon and, and uh, André Breton. I, I met years later, uh, my very good friend, uh, Jean-Marie Leclesio also. And Jean-Marie Leclesio, the French writer, was uh, very well read in the American poetry because they uh, were talk, uh, talking about Mexico City, about the country, the culture, the mythology, that was very, very rich. And also, uh, Margaret Randall came in the 60s. I, I almost met her just uh, arriving to Mexico City. She was with the father of a child and also with the Mexican poet, Sergio Mondragón, that together they make this very good magazine, El Corno Empulmado, that was the, the first uh, really American magazine of poetry because they were publishing American poets, Mexican poets, Brazilian poets, South American poets. They were very open and very dynamic poetry. And it was a bilingual magazine, Margaret, Margaret magazine, El Corno Apurmado. It was histo a historic magazine. Wonderful, Homero. Thank you so much for, for sharing that with us. Um, we're running a little short on time here, but um, Margaret, do you have any, any thoughts, anything final that you would like to say? Um, I, I just wanted to say that um, the beats continue to be really, the beat poets continue to be really important throughout Latin America. I put together an anthology, a, a large anthology of beat poetry, uh, which was translated into Spanish by the Cuban translator, um, Adelmus Anoseto, fabulously translated. I mean, someone who could translate uh, Peter Orlovsky and and uh, and people like that. And um, the book was uh, published in Spain. It's been published in um, in Chile, and it uh, just came out. Uh, it was presented at the Havana Book Fair the day before yesterday in Cuba. So. Um, you know, people continue to be inspired by the beats and especially poets throughout Latin America. Um, it's been very important to the Nadaistas. The beats have been very important to the Nadaistas in Colombia, uh, to um, uh, the Techo de, de la Ballena group in Venezuela, um, to Cuban poets, Argentinian poets. So, um, you know, that's... Uh, it's, and then there are people like Raquel Holorowski, uh, a Peruvian poet who uh, was present at those uh, salons at Philip Lamantia's house in the early 60s. And uh, she, um, we published a book of hers called Ajitojan. Uh, it was our number 12 of El Cuarón Plumado. That book is being reproduced now in a facsimile edition um, in the United States, it'll be out in a couple of months um, by a publishing house in Texas. So, you know, the 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 conversations continue. Fantastic. David, yeah. any final thoughts? Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, I don't know whether Honoro was able to see this picture earlier of uh, Maria Sabina and someone uh, on the chat. Could you show that one more time? Because I think yeah. that- yes. This is a, a wonderful photo taken by a fellow in Los Angeles. Uh, and uh, she looks like a pre-Colombian goddess. <laughs> yeah, yes. And I, I just wanted to emphasize because I do have, uh, you know, Margaret and Bonnie Bremser and Joanne Kiger that this is yet another great female. Uh, she's not a beat exactly, but she, she represents the sort of power that uh, I'm trying to evoke here. But it is the... Uh, and I also, Homoro, uh, 
Homero Arigis created a novel based on Maria Sabina's life entitled Carne de Dios, Flesh of the God, the translation of the Nahuatl word for the psychedelic mushrooms, Teo Nanakatl. And John Lennon, Ginsburg, Burroughs, Kerouac, La Montilla all make appearances in the narrative. And Arigis describes Sabina's veladas, mushroom eating ceremonies, and her naming of the mushrooms as her saint children. So uh, I just wanted to let you know I uh, I appreciated your role as well, Homero. With uh, I want to show you the the cover of the book with Maria Sal uh, Sabine in the cover. Uh, the book Carne de Dios, Flesh of God, referring to the hallucinogenous mushrooms. This is the cover of the book. Now uh, to be, you have to turn your video uh, on, Homero. Uh, how Betty. Betty. So let's. I let's don't know how to. <laughs> uh, there's a little prompt on your screen. I think it, it asks you if you click it, you can turn it on. It should be flashing in front of you. Es que está apagado mi video. Dice, dice que, sí, espérate. Dice que nada más. Pregúntale qué tenemos que hacer. It doesn't. Yeah, you should. Yeah. There you yeah. go. Okay. Yes. Good. Well, okay. this is the the book about Maria Sabina. Yes. Yes, I have it. Yes. Yes. You know, when she came to Mexico City, we, we interned her in a hospital, the general hospital. And when we arrived to see her next morning, many doctors and uh, people in the hospital were coming to see her. She, she was the sensation in the hospital, general hospital in Mexico City. And I learned that the, the indigenous influence, the chamanistic presence was very alive in Mexico, really through Maria Sabina. And she was the only person I met that I felt that she was very special. She was walking, as she was flying. She did her a very light body, and you didn't feel that uh, the, she, I, I thought that she was wasteless, had no uh, wave. She was very uh, aerial, uh, uh, spiritual character, Maria Sabina. I was very touched when on your, I learned that you and your wife helped her when she was ill. And, yes. uh, I actually end the book, if you don't mind, I'll just say this will be my final. This is a quote from Maria Sabina. There is a world beyond ours, a world that is far away and nearby, both invisible and seen. And there is where God lives, the spirits and the saints, a world where everything has already happened and everything is known. The world talks. It has a language of its own. I report what it says. The sacred mushrooms take me by the hand and bring me to the world where everything is known. It is them, the sacred mushrooms, that speak in a way I can understand. I ask them and they reply to me. When I return from the journey, I say what they have said to me, what they have shown me. I think that's very beautiful. <laughs> I think uh, that's a, probably an excellent note with which we can end on. And I am ever grateful to the three of you for for spending time with us. Homero, I'm so sorry that, that we had such technical problems, but we're very, very grateful that, that you could be with us. Yes. Margaret Randall, I look forward to our event in the summer. That's gonna be very exciting. David, best of luck in future projects. I wanna thank everybody for joining us tonight. I'll remind you that we have posted links in the chat function of your Zoom dashboard with which you may purchase books. Uh, also want to remind everybody, City Lights is now open for business. We're open seven days a week from 12 noon until 8 p.m. Please come on down, browse our stacks if you're in the hood. Tonight's event has been made possible by support from the City Lights Foundation, continuing the legacy of our founder, the late Lawrence Ferlinghetti, through public events like this one, our publishing program, and educational outreach, all dedicated to sustaining a vibrant community of readers, writers, and independent thinkers. So... Be safe, everyone. Be well. We hope to see you all again soon. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello to everybody. Very Adios. happy to meet you through this uh, the dialogue. Maya, con Dios.
Sí, sí. 